All right. Um, something I think is worth noting about social psychology that we didn't talk about yesterday. All right, I thought about this this morning, so I want to add this to our discussion from yesterday. I don't know why I didn't think of this. What makes social experiments different, right? So we're going to talk about Stanley Milgram's obedience experiment. That's a famous one. We're going to talk about Solomon Ashe's conformity experiment. That's a famous one. We're, of course, going to talk about Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment. And there's a lot of critique from that. It's come under scrutiny lately about the validity of the findings, whether or not people were playing the part as actors is in the study. So all that to say this. Prior to studying human social behavior, right? So you have lab research, which is obviously the ideal form of scientific research. You, you have a lab setting. You can control all the variables and all the factors. You can eliminate outside influences. But the downside to lab research right, is, is going to be some type of bias. So here's the problem. Social psychologists run into some critique, right? Uh, you, you get psychology as the rat science because there's a cognitive bias that comes in when we're testing the behavior of people. So here's what I mean. This is what I want to say. This becomes the beginning of the use of deception as part of the research process. So depending on who you read, especially if you go to college and study psychology at a higher level, there are a lot of varying subfields of psychology that reject social experiments because they think there are too many confounding variables, there are too many issues in the field that you can't control, and a lot of them have an ethical problem with deception. Right? So if you, let's say, for instance, you were testing, um, I don't know, you were testing uh, the bystander effect, which basically states, it's almost like a type of social loafing. It states that if you witness something happen, some kind of accident or tragedy, um, and you were in a big crowd, you would be less compelled to help or assist because just implicitly you believe that someone else will help them, right? You feel less responsibility because there's more options. That's the bystander effect. So there's ways that you could test that. You could go, you know, to the boardwalk at the beach and you could like, I don't know, pretend to have a heart attack and fall down, right? So you can see obviously why that would be problematic. You, you're, you are unwittingly roping people into your guise, into your, into your ruse, right? So there, there is some legitimate criticism that has to be considered when it comes to social experimentation. There's also the issue that people aren't really officially agreeing to participate in your study, right? So if someone stops and helps you at Publix and they don't know that you're actually secretly filming them or you're conducting an experiment, you can run into issues with that because there's not really actually consent there. So there is we should point out that there is some valid criticism for field experiments and social experiments. So one might ask, why then? Why would Solomon Ash try to test conformity? Why would Stanley Milgram test obedience and electric shock um, obedience in an experiment? Why do the Stanford Prison? If there's confounding variables, if there's ethical flaws, if there's, if there's not causal relationships, why should we bother to do these experiments? Well, examples with things like, oh, I'm going the wrong way, things like the Solomon Ash experiment, he's testing conformity. We want to predict behavior, right? It's similar to a correlational study, but we're not predicting based on data trends. We're, we're predicting based on our sample size, right? So for instance, in, in Milgram's experiment, I think he did 15 or 16 different replications. So it's not a huge sample size, but you get a representative sample. And the idea is that if you get a statistically significant number, in his case, I think it was 66%, then you're, you can predict things based on that. It's not a scientifically 100% empirical conclusion. That's the downside. So the hard lab scientists kind of would, would, would scoff at this. And I don't, I don't disagree with them in, in, in lab experimentation and say like, biology, botany, physics, right, zoology, those things compared to psychology as a social field of study. But it doesn't mean that we don't want to know those things, right? So I'll give you an example from Ash's experiment, right? In Solomon Ash's experiment, let's look at just, just if we were to replicate this, I just want you to visualize what, what it is that Solomon Ash is actually doing. So Solomon Ash would this is in 1955 at Yale, and he wants to test how willing participants are to conform, basically to lose confidence in a very obviously correct answer because of group pressure. 
Now, some people get hung up too much on the idea of conformity, and they're like, well, why would I feel the need to fit in with strangers so much so that I would reject a clearly obvious comparison of a line segment? It's so inconsequential, right? But there's more to it than that. Sometimes people are not conforming because they want to be accepted by a group. Sometimes they would conform because so many people are confident in their answer that they just assume they're the ones that are wrong. And that's significant, right? So let's, let's take a look at it. So what Ash did is he, had, he would have three or four participants. I think in one case he might have had seven or eight. And, and all but one of them were confederates in the study, meaning that they were in on the deception. They knew what the purpose of the study was. They were, they were acting in order to contribute to the deception. So you get people to consent to being in a study. They show up to be in the study, but, but Ash is using a small form of harmless deception so that it doesn't bias the results. And if you were to do something similar, right, even if it wasn't conformity, what if you went, like, thought your little brother was stealing money from your room? Well, you'd set up this little hidden camera, leave some cash out on top of your nightstand, and you want to try to catch him in the act. Well, that's another prime example right, of, of, of surveillance. You can't tell them that this is what you're testing because it's going to skew your results. So there's pros and cons to field types of research. But basically, field experiments are good at presenting, presenting better hypotheses, we'll say. It's probably a good way to look at it. So Solomon Ash would bring people in. All of them are together. They're all talking and discussing, unknowingly that most of them are Confederates. They get brought into this room. They sit them down at a table. All right, so here's a packet, here's a packet, here's a packet, here's a packet. There's eight of you. You all have instructions. It's real simple. What we're going to do is we're going to test how well your visual acuity is or whatever deception he told them. In the instructions, every one of the Confederates, it told them which number line segment to say, to cite. In the person, in the person who wasn't the Confederate, they, their instructions were, Name the number of line segment that's the closest in length to X. So he would put up the first, <coughs> excuse me, put up the first card. And everybody in the first few rounds is in agreement. And it'll say, say line segment number two, right? So participant number one, two. Participant number two, 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 two. They go down the line. You get to the end, they're like, yeah, I think it's two also. Okay, next card. And they bring in the next card. And they have the same instructions. So for the first few rounds, everybody's in agreement. It's very clear, right? Line segment X, in this case, is the closest in length to number four. So everybody, four, four, four. We're all in agreement. And at some point in, the, in, in a few trials, the instructions change. But since they're not being given verbally, the participant doesn't know. So now all of a sudden, you have all these Confederates very confidently and quickly mentioning the wrong line segment. And so now it becomes kind of interesting. And in some replications, they said different line segments and they argue about it. One of them's like, no, it's nine. And the next person, participant two, is like, it's not. It's clearly seven. And participant three is like, no, it's nine. And then you get down to the last person and they're like, oh, no. And the assumption is, is that maybe somehow they've screwed up the instructions. Maybe somehow they're not correct. So it's not so much conformity of like, I want these people to like me so much, I'm going to lie about a line segment. No, it's... Ash is studying conformity. How likely are people, especially people who are not secure with themselves and confident in their answers, how likely are they to change their position because they assume that they are wrong, right? And what that points to, the power of conformity, is that we put strength into the, the, the statistical group, right? So it's like a who wants to be a millionaire situation. You guys remember that from the early 2000s? Where, bless you. So you get it, questions like, you know, which is the largest conifer tree in Washington State? No idea. So the, I want to poll the audience. So you poll the audience and, you know, 86% of them says it's C. All right, I'll go with C, right? And you, why not, right? You have nothing to lose. You don't know the answer. So the idea here is this conformity comes from confidence in numbers, right? Confidence in numbers. And you can use Ash's example to explain, you know, like, I don't know, religious beliefs or, 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 or scientific beliefs or, I don't know, political narratives, right? There, there used to be this, this phrase that people would say, oh, well, you know, can a million people be wrong? Yeah, a million people are often wrong. Right? A billion people can be wrong. Right? There's a billion Catholics in the world and there's a billion Muslims in the world, right? The conflicting ideologies. It's a fifth of the world's population. So the strength in numbers might 
point to a possible consensus. But consensus, even though it gives us confidence, doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct. So that's Solomon Ash. And you're going to get a question about Ash, and it's going to talk about line segments. That got away from me. Uh, and so I just don't want, I, I thought it would be easier if you visualize that. And you kind of, what is he talking about? Line segments. So I want to talk into, what last, yesterday we, this is kind of where we left off. We were talking about things like social loafing. We talked about attribution theory, right? To what are we placing the responsibility for whatever it is? Is it the trait, which would be the disposition of the person? Is it the situation in which they find themselves? So I'll give you an example, if you just want to put an example in your notes. The Stanford Prison Experiment is a defense of situational attribution, right? So Zimbardo was making the case, and has, he's, he's been on the stand as a key witness in cases um, he's making the argument psychologically that people will do, they will participate in behaviors that are outside of what they would normally do, morally, ethically, whatever, because of the toxic culture that they're in, right? And there's a good TED Talk where Zimbardo talks about this. He, um, he, he talks about the Abu Ghraib trials, right? The U.S. Marines that were put on trial for, uh, for their, uh, you know, abuse of, of criminals, war criminals uh, in Iraq. And, and he was called in as a key witness, and, and the idea was he was supposed to be the star psychological witness who was testifying of the psychological, I don't know, trauma or damage from the environment in which those Marines were in, in the prison ward where they were stationed. And so they didn't win the case, it's worth noting, but I'm just trying to point out that Zimbardo is defense of a situational attribution. Right? He's blaming the situation for the behavior, not the disposition of the person, not the trait of the person. Right? So now we're going to get into some more social aspects in a bigger group. Right? So get away from attribution theory. Let's get away from passionate versus companionate love and the mere exposure effect. Right? And it, to take a darker look at the mere exposure effect, like, it can be a positive thing, like intimacy first and then attraction develops. Like That's good. That's positive. That's warm and fuzzy. Right? But it also can be a psychological mind control device, right? So it's kind of a form of almost gaslighting, which is a problematic term, obviously. But um, what starts out as small requests, it's like a sales tactic, you know, get them agreeing. Wouldn't you agree that? That's a sales tactic they teach you in sales training. Um, and they teach you things like, well, how do you convince your customer, right, to, to, to buy your product? Well, part of that process is getting people to agree with you. Same thing in a political discussion. If you're having a debate about something that you're passionate about, one of the ways that you can connect, you can kind of olive branch with people, to use that metaphor, is you find common ground on which you can agree. Wouldn't you agree that? Wouldn't you agree that? Wouldn't it be fair to say that? Right? And that's the sales tactic. If I could save you money and time and make it more efficient, isn't that something you would be interested in doing? No, I'm not interested. No, 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 just answer the question. Wouldn't you be interested in saving money? Sure. Right? So it's a tactic. We're getting people to agree to something. The problem with that is if you take advantage of that, the foot in the door phenomenon can become real dark real quickly because a lot of times, like especially stakeholders, like teachers, coaches, I don't know, like religious people, uh, I mean like clergy, like they can take advantage of their position with the foot in the door phenomenon because small requests turn into bigger requests and they turn into bigger requests and they and before you know it it's psychological control that's by the way what narcissists do narcissists will control people by using the foot in the door phenomenon they will slowly increase the demands of what they ask of someone and then they will chastise them for not living up to the expectation and make them feel bad about it right so the foot in the door phenomenon can be positive but it also kind of has a dark connotation too. It's a, it's a psychological control device, right? So you slowly, increasingly give up more and more, right? Just like slowly giving away pieces of your civil rights. You don't want to do that because it's going to just be more and more and more. Well, this is valid. I'm fine with this. I'm fine with them. Like, like people don't, right? Like the gun control argument, right? It's a good argument. People would say, oh, well, you know, I don't think that people need to have guns. We live in America. We're safe. We have a police force. It's fine. They can take these away. There's, it's not an illogical argument. But that's not why it's problematic. It's problematic because it's one step in an inevitable chain of things. You say, no, you're just being paranoid. Am I, though? Am I? 
right? So what starts as a small request, a lot of times turns into bigger and bigger requests. And even if not, you're not intentionally trying to control people, you become empowered by the, oh, well, that person gave me money. They'll give me a little bit money more, right? And that's how we enable addicts too, right? So right, what starts out is compliance. Then before you know it, you're actively assisting them and, and you're trying to help them, right? And that's what happens when parents enable their kids too, right? It's foot in the door phenomenon. Like you slowly give in to small things and then the kids take advantage of that and they throw a fit when you're in public, right? And then they stop talking to you. They, you know, whatever it is the kids do to get their way, right? Little psychological deviants that they are, right? Mind control specialists. That's what kids do. Foot in the door phenomenon. We start with small requests, but it gradually becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger, increasingly more serious request. That's foot in the door phenomenon, right? It starts small, gains big slippery slope, as somebody said yesterday. It was a good example. So let's talk about some more vocab that is group related, group dynamics. We talked about Erickson yesterday, how Erickson believes that you develop through social tasks, right? That's more the person, the disposition of that person, not the situation so much. Let's talk about group dynamics for a second. Okay, because you're seeing this play out in the culture that you live in right now. Here, to me, here's the problematic thing. I could sit down and I could be persuaded to see the merits of a lot of the social movements that have been going on for the last year, even the last five years. My issue is not with the narrative. My issue is with the identity politics that exist around the narrative. Right? So you have to track with me a little bit. I'm going to say some things that are going to make you mad because you're politically biased, and then I'm going to say some things against the other side that will probably make them mad, and then you'll be happy again. The point is, those types of issues are good examples of things like group think and group polarization. Right? So you have the in-group and the out-group, and you have vocab terms like the in-group bias. Right? So let's talk about this word first. Before we get into some of the other ones, even though it's not in order, let's talk about group think. If you want to write that term down, that's an important term. Group think. Group think is what happens when the power of a narrative takes over logic. That's the way that I think about it in my mind. It's a little different than the way it is in the textbook. Let me say that again. Group think happens when the power or the frenzy of a narrative takes over the logic behind the narrative. And here's what's sad about that. Sometimes you get a legitimate movement that becomes delegitimatized. That's not a thing. I don't think that's a word. It, it loses its legitimacy, we'll say, because of groupthink, right? I, I'll just give you an example, right? Here's, this, is a, this, is a, this is a positive example, right, of a negative form of groupthink. A negative form of groupthink would be like, I'm going to call it tacit. Tacit racism in the Jim Crow South. Why do I say tacit? I know there was active racism. There's a lot of active racism, but I'm not going to let the tacit people off the hook. I mean, maybe it's unfair, maybe it's a situational attribution, but here's the thing. Let's say that there were people, good, hardworking, American, white people, who were not racist or prejudicial or discriminatory in any way towards people of color in the Jim Crow South. But do I hold them responsible for acts of discrimination? No, I don't hold them responsible for acts of discrimination. That's the difference between discrimination and prejudice. Prejudice is a type of bias that you have, right? Discrimination is an actual behavior, an actual act. It's the prevention of, the allowance of, or the engagement in an act based on a prejudice, right? So prejudice is a bias, it's a thought process. It's not so much the actual act. So if you're gonna say something like there's an inherent implicit racial bias in a system. I'll buy that. Is there actual racial discrimination that we need to evaluate? And I think there is. In some systems, I think there is actual discrimination going on. But there's a difference between prejudice and discrimination, and people get those mixed up on tests all the time. So that's why I'm saying tacit racism, compliant racism. You had people who fell victim. Maybe they didn't even agree with the narrative, but their dissenting voice gets swallowed up by a frenzy. Groupthink is when the narrative gains a life of its own and it swallows up any logic. Now, so if racial prejudice in the Jim Crow South was the example of groupthink, a lot of people got swept up in that. So much so that it became the culture of the states in the South. To be the dissenting voice against 
the integration of schools was a difficult thing to be. So I'm not letting people off the hook, but I'm explaining what groupthink is, right? What it is is the enthusiasm, as this person uses. I'm going to use the, the frenzy of a narrative takes over the logic. And now all of a sudden, we don't really have a movement. We have like an identity group, right? So you see this groupthink situation happen in, in, in news media outlets today. Yes? Um, so is groupthink mainly uh, like based on the, the area where the group is? Could be. A lot of times. It's hard to say that yes. people that live in the South, like, you know what I mean? Because right. the, the, to apply that to something now, like. Not now. Yeah, maybe not now. You can't, yeah. you can't really use that now because so many different, like, there's so many different areas where people are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like so it could be, yeah, it could be geographically isolated. And a lot of times it is, right? A lot of times it is geographically isolated. I mean, you might even get little tiny pockets of like, like really, if you watch the documentary about the, you know, the college admissions scandal, you know, I mean, and you got these small pockets of really wealthy, affluent, privileged people, you know, who have every advantage and they still cheat. You know, that might be, well, that's the exception. Like to them, that's, it's not so much, oh, I think this is acceptable behavior. It's like, well, this is the norm. This is just what we do. Right? It's almost like cognitive dissonance. In my mind, I would say, that's wrong. No one should ever do that. But in my behavior, here I am doing it. Right. So you're right. I think it's, it may be geographically pocketed. Right. So that's why I like to use the example of the Jim Crow South. Because obviously there's racism everywhere, and there's racism definitely in the South still. But I think that's a better example because it was almost like an entire regional phenomenon. I mean, actual policy of racism. So yes, that's fair. Here, here's another example. I'm going to use the Fox News effects and the MSNBC effect. I don't think that CNN, to the same degree, creates groupthink like Fox does and like MSNBC does. So here's the thing. These news media outlets create groupthink because what they do is they create, this, they create a group, in-group. So this is what I'm going to chastise a lot of political ideologies today back and forth. But there are things that bother me a lot and things that I just understand and accept. One of the hypocritical things that I don't like about the direction that the Republican Party is heading in is that people who are self-proclaimed fiscal conservatives, constitutional conservatives, don't realize how not conservative they are anymore. So what I mean by that is there were a lot of things that, 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 that traditionally conservative right-wing Republicans have accepted. And the reason why they've accepted them is because their fearless leader or the organization that supported him until he rejected them, and now they all reject Fox News. Why? Because of groupthink, right? Fox News called the election too early. They don't want to see Trump succeed, so now Fox News is out, right? That's an example of groupthink. It d again, keep in mind, the validity of the narrative is not the problem. They could be right. It doesn't matter. The point is, Fox told me so. Therefore, this is how I believe. And MSNBC has the same little groupie followers. Rachel Maddow said it. It's real. Right? You see that tweet of, like, Kamala Harris is getting off the steps. Did you see that picture, you know, in, in Florida off of, you know, Air Force One? And, and her, her tweet quote was, like, Florida, I'm here to help. What? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, are you on spring? I'm confused. She was, she was alluding to the, the loose lawlessness of non-COVID restrictions that we have in our dangerous Wild West state where there are piles of bodies in the street. Oh, there's not. Oh. So, again, I'm going to be taking shots at everybody today. Just buckle up and be ready for that. Right? I, I just I like to call it hypocrisy where I see it. Sometimes I'm, I'm guilty of hypocrisy, and so people point that out to me, and they're correct, or I figure it out later, and oops, my bad. So I'm not immune to it, but we all are. Again, biases are biases. We have biases. We don't realize it. We shouldn't intentionally fall victim to our biases. But that, to me, there, there's a positive thing about what the critical race theory narrative is trying to do. But I don't like how it's being enacted. So the idea behind recognizing deeply rooted implicit biases is a good thing. but I don't like how it's being instituted, right? So recognizing biases is important to make sure that you, you, you are cognizant of your ability to be biased even when you want to pretend that you're not. 
But that's not the same thing as actual discrimination, right? It's not the same thing. And that doesn't mean you should be okay with racial bias. You should be cognizant of biases that you might potentially fall victim to. But to go out of your way to act not in such a way as most of the people in your race may or may not act, which somehow is not racist also, by the way. I, I, don't, I don't like the destination. I get the ideology behind critical race theory. I don't like, I don't like how it's being put into practice, I guess we'll say, right? So, I mean, that's a form of bias. And I think that it's catching traction because of groupthink. You saw this a lot in the last administration. That was a great example of groupthink. It really didn't matter if the policy was beneficial for America or not. The orange man signed it. He's behind it. I don't want it. Or the orange man signed it. He's behind it. That's what we need. Roll Tide. Right? That's illogical. That's called group polarization. We got the Red Hat Society and the anti-Red Hat Society. And there's nowhere in between. Police matter or black people matter, and that's it. You can't be all lives matter, that's a cop out. <laughs> it's, that's, that's an example of identity politics. The psychological, sociological word for that is groupthink. I'm just giving you that as an example, right? Again, do not let me downplay legitimate narratives. It's not about the merit of what's being said. I know that sounds crazy, but track with me. My problem is not what they're trying to a spouse. The problem is, is that people don't even analyze or evaluate it. They just go, Joe good, Trump bad, Trump good, Joe bad. It's group polarization. That's what happens. And it gets worse. Why are party politics, why is there such a great divide? Because you go on to say like a, a college campus or you go into like a, a city or a job market or whatever, you, especially in college, right? You go into college and you find your people. You look around and you're like, hmm, I see chubby shorts and mullets and Bush Reagan, Bush Reagan 84, that's my people, that's my people. And then what happens? You get into the Alpha Delta douche, whatever it is, right? And then, and then you, and, and you're, you know, cramming natty lights and solving the world's problems, you know, one hate crime at a time. So the thing is, again, I'm taking shots at everybody today. Get ready. So, but it happens in reverse too. The other side's like where my tree hugger's at. Where are the girls that don't shave their armpits at? There, there's my people, BLM, BLM, there's my people, BLM. And here's what happens with group polarization. We identify with the group, not with the narrative. That's the problem. I don't have an issue with the narrative because we don't talk about the narrative. We identify with the group. That's the social problem. The sociological explanation here is we get into the group that's the end group for us, and we get around this, this, this narrative vacuum, and all we listen to are non-dissenting voices, the only people we follow on social media are people that agree with us. And what happens is this vacuum creates a chasm. And you get to the point where you're like, how could these idiots not see my point of view? How could they be so dumb? And then the other side's like, how could those idiots not see my point of view? It's clear. But it's not about a message or a narrative. It's about the group identity politics, right? Um, so do you think that the, with like, like due to cities, people group together like, like gerrymandering and things like that? No, because people, if people look for their group. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like most like, democratic strongholds yeah. are cities. Yeah. And a lot of times rural Agreed. areas are, are mm -hmm. rural areas. Do you think that due to like more cities being created that we've kind of polarized? Like, Maybe. That's a valid point. So like urbanization may be contributing to polarization. But if your theory is right, and I think it is, you're right. Urban areas tend to be the centers for democracy. So if that is the case, then we're going through some growing pains. So rural people are becoming urbanized and they're being exposed to narratives that they've never had to be exposed to before. And I think that's the key. Same thing on social media. The, the thing that scares me the most about data mining is not like communicating with your friends. What scares me the most about data mining is the fact that you don't have to be exposed to a dissenting voice, a narrative. So I can live my whole life in the digital world and not ever have to listen to or consider an opposing point of view. So yes, I do think that's astute. I do think with increased urbanization and urban sprawl, y you might see a growing political divide. I, I tend to believe it has more to do with media outlets and things like that and social media and the fact that millennials are dumb and Facebook warriors. But, but yeah, I do think that will help because I also think in urban settings, you do get prejudice because people are exposed to each other, but that's usually a growing pain for 
inclusion because then when you're exposed to people, right? You live in diverse populations and you have access to people and usually your opinion for someone is not based on an identity politic, it's based on the one dude George that I knew in second grade, right? So you would say that, that this, like the hub that we're experiencing right now is just a... Hopefully. I'm saying there's validity to what, what you're suggesting. If the, in, if the expanded urban sprawl is creating more divisiveness because rural people are being drawn into cities where it tends to be more liberal, the positive to that could be that we could be going through a growing pain right, of growth, just like racial integration was. Racial integration had some tumultuous times attached to it. right? Um, but then we came out the other side somewhat, I mean, at least better than we were. But, but, and the, but and the flip side of that coin is even if it's not, I don't know how you can, I don't know how you can avoid that. Well, and I'd say that, that it, it's still like, I mean, how some 50 years later, it's still not good enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? So how long is that? Well, like? okay, so that's a good point too. So a lot of sociologists look at like, all right, so some people say it's fair to say, look at how far we've come. And, and then somebody else would say, well, yeah, but we have a long way to go. Both of those things are true though. Right? And when you look at the standard of living in the world, Global poverty. So global poverty is defined by the UN as the amount of people that live on, I think it's $1.95 a day. What $1.95 will buy you. <laughs> That's not a lot. So what $1.95 a day will buy you is the like global universal definition for, for, for abject poverty. In the United States, it's not. Our definition for poverty, the poverty line is how much salary does a person or a household have to make to buy basic necessities, rent, groceries, gas, whatever. So like for instance, in Santa Rosa County, the poverty line is measured at $24,000 a year. To live and get the basic necessities in Santa Rosa County, you have to have access to $24,000 a year or you can't make ends meet. So cost of living matters, right, obviously. But so there's a definition for poverty. Compared to 50 years ago, the abject poverty rate has, has decreased by more than 60%. Now does that mean we stop? No, but is it fair to look at how far we've come Yes, the same thing is true with climate change, um, that we're seeing residual after effects in, in changes in the climate, but in green technology and lack of pollution, and right, those things happen unintentionally, people become aware of them, and then spend some time trying to fix them, right? So that's where we're at. We're not at the solution phase yet, and I would say the same thing for like racial equality. I don't know if we're heading in the right direction or not. I'm just gonna be honest with you. But I do know that people, just as a general whole, which is probably not fair, I'm gonna, I'm gonna consider the bigots outliers. When, when we look at something like the Jim Crow South, they were definitely not the outliers. So it may seem like a moral victory to say we're heading in the right direction, but I don't think it's invalid. I would say that, like, looking at things like, well, like, take climate change, for right. example, at what point is it okay to say that we've done enough? Or, like, I, to say that, oh, look how far we've gone. Like, I, think that, I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. I think that you can celebrate the positive changes that society has decided to make while at the same time evaluating how much more is necessary. Well, yeah, but what's, what's enough to celebrate? I don't know, because who gets to define that? I mean, well, you're right, I, because... I agree, but, like, until you... It, how can you sell it? But, but, but that's a moving target. So when we say, like, fix what? Well, we, we, we saw natural habitats adjust themselves just during the quarantine, right? Like in places like Venice, right? So again, here's another example of, of like, groupthink. There are people that will argue with you tooth and nail that, that, that there's not a human intervention in climate change. Well, explain how when there's no longer combustion engine boat traffic in Venice for six months the rivers become clear again, right? It's, it doesn't take an ecologist to recognize the obvious evidence there. So I'm with you. I, I think, I, but I don't know the answer. I don't know if there's a quantifiable way to say, congratulations, cell five, we have fixed global warming. But I, I do think that awareness of issues is what drives the innovation towards the right direction. And I think, right, what started, what started the, the cognitive awareness of racial injustice. So if groupthink is Jim Crow race, racial prejudice in the South, an actual discrimination in the South, then Dr. King is minority influence. Right? So when you look at the, the 
When you look at the, let's call minority an influence as a vocab term, let's call that an opposite to groupthink. Right, because groupthink is the frenzy of a party, not even party, the, the frenzy of a narrative just like swallows up logic. Minority influence is the small but willing dissenting voice for change, right? So like, okay, so for example, uh, like Republicans that would say like Trump is doing wrong. Right, that would be minority influence because the, what they're doing is they're not rejecting their morals and ethics, they're speaking out against a narrative, right? If, if someone who is a card-carrying voting Republican makes a critical statement for something the president does, that's, that's what you want. You want people to evaluate, right, um, individual scenarios. You don't want them to blindly follow one leader or the other, right? So that's, and that's the issue, right? So a, a good example, right, and that's a good one. So for instance, like, there's a lot of things that conservatives just not only accepted, but but forgave and rationalized just because Trump did it. But the left did the same thing during the BLM movement last year. So the BLM movement, and, and to be fair to the organization, I don't in any way, shape, or form think this was their intention. I think their movement got hijacked. Because what happened is you see this inclusive movement for social justice that gets completely hijacked by destructive people. So what did that turn into? Group polarization. It turned into the... BLM versus Blue Lives Matter scenario, and that's not that's not where we were supposed to go with this. So right? would you say that, like, so since the like like racism is so deep rooted within, like, uh, it's called situational, uh, right? Yeah. Country, but like, would you say that there always has been, and like, as long as they continue to fight against what, like, you know, I mean, like, BLM, whatever BLM is fighting for. Yeah. Fox News are people that will push the narrative that they're like destruction, like right. anarchists. Right. When, you know, of course, like, it's hard Antifa. because. Antifa. Yeah, when it's Antifa, not BLM, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it's either Antifa or it's not. Yeah. I mean, or it's, yeah, or it's not Antifa at all. Right, exactly. So, But you're right, you're right. So Fox News is propping up BLM as the opposing, you know, negative, you know, whatever, like they're making them, they're targeting them, as, that's called scapegoat theory, right? So that's another vocab word. And you're right, let's assume, for the sake of argument, that racial, well, not even racial, let's assume that some level of prejudice is always going to exist among people that are different. So when there's racial equality, and there's no longer a debate over racial preference or racial justice, then the prejudice is going to be economic. Or the, or the prejudice is going to be in a caste system of privileged versus unprivileged. It's going to be male versus female. It's going, so there are always going to be dissenting voices because that's scapegoating. It's a scapegoat theory that says that instead of accepting responsibility for something, and maybe that's not even a fair way to put it, but yes, I'll just say this. I personally believe there will always be some level of bias and, and even discrimination, but there will definitely be prejudice. 